This video is about what the functional groups are for in AP Biology. Coming right up. Hey guys, this is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy, and on this channel, we cover AP Biology content. In today's video, I thought we'd take a quick look at these crazy looking functional groups from the unit on biochemistry. The problem with these functional groups is that it comes up pretty early on in the course before we've had an opportunity to dig a bit deeper into things like macromolecules. So it really freaks students out who sort of took biology to escape chemistry. Well, today you're in luck because I'm going to tell you just exactly why the functional groups are taught in AP Bio. So first, let's put some things into perspective. In this early part of the course, we begin talking about something called carbon. Carbon, of course, is a very special element because its atomic structure allows for numerous and flexible bonding with other substances. For example, we have methane, ethane, propane, butane, butene, cyclohexane, and the list goes on. But you know what's more boring than functional groups, though? It's these hydrocarbons. All those molecules that you've just seen are all called hydrocarbons because they exclusively contain hydrogens and carbons in their structure. And they're all pretty boring to us biologists for one very specific reason. They're all nonpolar. This means that these hydrocarbons are non-soluble in water, and because cells are mostly made of water, these molecules would want nothing to do with these cells, meaning that for us biologists, we're mostly like indifferent to these substances, unless we make them a bit more interesting. So let's begin with our very first functional group, the hydroxyl group. See, if we take something like ethane, we can see that there are these two carbons and all of the other hydrogens. If we think of these hydrogens as potential slots or positions at which we could add functional groups, maybe I can take this hydrogen and replace it with a hydroxide. Now, the reason that I did this is that like H2O, O and H has polarity, meaning that the attachment of this hydroxide group to this boring ethane made it into a polar molecule with the name ethanol, which is of course an alcohol. Now I can show you how this applies to other things that you've learned here in AP Bio. Check out all of these sugars. We have glucose, fructose, galactose, ribose, ribulose, and all of them are packed with these hydroxide groups. And they should be because sugars dissolve in water. And if they didn't, they'd be sort of the worst molecules to use as energy ever. So let's do another one. How about the carbonyl group? So here the carbonyl group refers to an oxygen that is attached once again to a hydrocarbon chain through a double bond. Here we see two possibilities where the carbonyl groups can exist in the middle of a carbon chain, which we call ketones, or at the end of a carbon chain, which we call aldehydes. Now the chemical properties carbonyl groups impart on these hydrocarbons don't matter that much for this course, but what does matter is where this comes up again. So we go back to the picture of the sugar molecules. Notice how we categorize different sugars by either the number of carbons that it has or the placement of the carbonyl groups. Here, of course, we refer to sugars as either aldoses or ketoses stemming precisely from our naming convention of these carbonyl groups. So now the picture is sort of coming together. We learn functional groups to understand sugars a little bit better. But what about the next two functional groups? So here we get the carboxyl group and the amino group. The carboxyl group is literally a carbonyl and a hydroxyl groups combined into one. And the amino group is sort of unique with its nitrogen. But here's the thing. We can take methane, remove the two hydrogens and add an amino group to one end and the carboxyl group to the other end. And and guess what we have? We get an amino acid. But of course, we can add a bunch of other things in that position too to get all of the 20 amino acids that we've studied. So now we can justify the first four groups based on our structure of sugars and amino acids. But how about some of these other weird functional groups like the sulfhydro group? Well, one thing that we can say is that it has a super easy name because it's literally a sulfur and a hydrogen. With the sulfhydro group, we revisit these amino acids that I just mentioned, but one in particular, it's cysteine. This is one of those two amino acids with a sulfur atom, the other being methionine. But the fact that the sulfur is found in a sulfhydro group allows cysteine to play a very important role in protein folding. These sulfur atoms form what we call a disulfide bridge, which are covalent bonds that provide an incredible amount of structural stability to polypeptides. Next, why do we learn about the phosphate group? Well, there are actually three reasons. One is the phospholipid, where the phosphate's negative charge results in the ability of the phospholipid to simultaneously be hydrophilic and and hydrophobic. Two is the phosphate groups found in the backbones of nucleic acids where the sugar and the phosphates alternate. Here too, the negativity of phosphate group plays an important role in understanding how DNA moves towards the positive pole in gel electrophoresis and how it wraps around these positively charged histones in the formation of chromatin. Three is in the nucleotides and their nucleoside triphosphate counterparts like the ATP. Of course here, these phosphates that are bound together can act as the currency of energy. And we also see 
see that the attachment of these phosphates to substances can even activate them in our signal transduction pathways. Lastly, we have the methyl group, which is largely a methane that can be added to something else. This is probably one that we'll see the least of in AP biology. But here, what we see is that methyl groups can largely create inertness in chemical reactivity of biological substrates to which it is bound. For instance, methylation of DNA can result in the silencing of that gene because methyl groups are, as hydrocarbons are, uh, pretty boring to biochemicals. So there we have it, guys. This is pretty much all you really need to know about these functional groups as they pertain to other things that you've learned in this course. Yes, they look scary, but I hope this video has shown you why you learned them and the extent to which you need to understand their functions. Now, if you found this video useful, be sure to click that like button and subscribe to the channel for more biology content just like this one. This has been Mikey with Able Prep Academy. I'll see you in the next video.